Hello and welcome back. In this lecture I want to talk about the kingdom fungi. So just take a minute and think about what do you know about fungi? So fungi have a lot of characteristics they share in common. They possess eukaryotic cells, that is cells with nuclei and complex cell structure with membrane bound organelles. They may be multicellular or they can be unicellular. So a unicellular fungi would be what we would call a yeast and a multicellular fungi would be what you would call a mushroom or what you would see outside as being a mushroom. DNA associated, uh, is associated with histone proteins. So they do have complex DNA, they have linear chromosomes and these chromosomes have proteins that help organize the DNA material. Um, their cells do have a cell wall made of chitin. Um, you've probably had uh, mushrooms on a pizza before or eaten mushrooms, and, and uh, so you've eaten chitin before, which is kind of cool. Most uh, are terrestrial, but some may be aquatic. There are freshwater and saltwater um, fungi. Fungi obtain nutrients uh, in several ways. They can be saprophytic, which means they dump their digestive enzymes onto the food that they want to decompose, and, uh, and uh, the enzymes will take and digest the food. They'll then absorb the nutrients through their cell, um, across their cell membranes. Uh, they can also be parasitic, living on uh, living cells. Most fungi are, uh, are going to be multicellular, and they, uh, their bodies are composed of filaments, so they're filamentous. The filaments make up the body of such fungi are called hyphae. So if you take a look down here at these tomatoes that are uh, rotting, um, they have fungi that's growing all over the surface of them. And that fungi, the little white strands, are, um, are the hyphae. The collection of hyphae is called the mycelium. So if you look over here, these are this is a scanning electron microscope picture of hyphae so you can see what it looks like. So if you've ever gone outside and flipped a log over and to look at you know something underneath of it and saw little cotton-like fibers, that's uh, hyphae. So all the soil, if you ever dig your fingers through soil, is going to have hyphae growing all through it. If you ever take a mushroom and split it open, what you're going to see are lots of these little filaments called hyphae. So this whole structure that you see here is made of hyphae. Um, the largest or organism in the world happens to be a, um, a fungus. Armorelia is the is a genus name, and it encompasses about 2,200 acres. Uh, this is out in the western part of the United States. And uh, the way they figured out that it's the same organism is, is they did little tests of, of hyphae all throughout this 2,200 acres and found that it was genetically identical. So we think that that is the world's, uh, one of the world's largest organisms. Um, it's thought to be somewhere in the order of 2,400 years old. Uh, maybe it'll keep growing for thousands of more years. Who knows? So fungi are classified based on their reproductive mode or on molecular data like sequences of DNA or um, RNA or um, amino acid sequences. Uh, not all mycologists agree with the classification scheme that I'm going to be uh, showing in this particular lecture, but it goes along with the one that's in our uh, online textbook. So there are different phyla of, uh, of the fungi in the kingdom fungi, and uh, Chytridiomycota is uh, one of them. Uh, we'll talk about uh, Zygomycota, we'll talk about Ascomycota, uh, Basidiomycota, and Glomeromycota. Each of these phyla have different uh, creatures that are in it, different species that have common characteristics with each other. I just want to take a few minutes and talk about each of the different phyla. Uh, they each have unique and interesting characteristics uh, that they share in common with each other if they're in the same, if they're in the same grouping. And uh, so phylum Chytridiomycota, you probably will never see this organism because they're microscopic. And I showed a picture of it down here, a microscopic view of it. But these are very serious organisms. Uh, they're aquatic and uh, they are unicellular. And uh, two species right now we're really worried about because of the worldwide decline in amphibians. I don't know if you know it, but uh, worldwide uh, salamanders and Sicilians and frogs 
are um, many of them are becoming extinct or they're declining in numbers and we attribute some of that decline to the spread of this particular organism uh, called chytrids so um, BD is one that's uh, affecting frogs and there is a new one that just uh, surfaced in Europe called B cell so BD stands for Batrichotridium dendrobatidis and uh, B cell stands for Batrichotridium Catridium salamandrivorans, and uh, these are alien species that have been brought over, usually from the pet trade. We think it's from the pet trade. So uh, people have bought pets from other areas of the world. They then get tired of those pets and caring for them, and they release them into uh, you know, ponds or streams that are located near their house because they get tired of uh, feeding them and caring for them. And then these little pathogens are spreading through our native populations of frogs. These are very serious and they are diminishing the biodiversity around the world in regards to amphibians. So in some streams you can actually go and find frogs that uh, have been infected with, uh, with the chytrid fungus. And what the chytrid fungus does is it gets into an, an, um, the skin and causes a thickening of the skin of the frog and, uh, or um, amphibian. And uh, amph many amphibians breathe through their skin so if they have a thicker skin they can't breathe as well. So, um, so the chytrid fungus is, uh, is the real deal. It's really important that we don't release pets into the environment so that we don't spread these. Now, B cell is not found in the United States yet, but um, you know, it is one that we're surveilling and, uh, and seeing if it's coming in. We're hoping uh, that it's not gonna come in. The uh, Fish and Wildlife Service has uh, just uh, recently uh, uh, banned the importation of certain salamanders because of the spread of this particular uh, organism. Now, why is that important in Virginia, you know, where, where um, this course is being uh, transmitted from? Um, in Virginia, we are, have a hot spot um, in the mountains of uh, endemic species of salamanders found nowhere else in the world. We in Virginia, North Carolina, and those Appalachian Mountains, um, there's many endemic species that if this organism comes in, it may cause the extinction of those particular species. So you do live in a state, if you live in Virginia, that has a, a, a great abundance of salamander species and frog species, and uh, we definitely want to protect them from the spread of this infection. So in the phylum uh, Zygomycota, um, these species are, uh, are, are interesting, and uh, they're mainly saphrobes, which means they're decomposers. They spit out the enzymes onto their food substance and then absorb the nutrients as the enzymes break it down. A few of them are parasitic. Um, these, these I put in here uh, are, are, as a little factoid, these are very important commercially because they cause food spoilage. If you notice, uh, there is fungal hyphae on both of these. There's a piece of bread over here and, uh, and strawberries over here. So we actively fight these things um, you know, to, to, uh, to uh, get food. Uh, we do use refrigeration, which, slow, which slows their, their growth down, and then we also use preservatives in our food to slow their growth as well. But uh, these definitely compete with us for food and uh, are commercially important. Uh, one of your labs will help have you grow um, fungi, hopefully grow some bread mold on a piece of bread. I would suggest for that lab you definitely use a piece of bread that is organic and does not have preservatives. I have seen bread last for weeks and weeks and weeks without molding because of the preservatives that are found in it. The life cycle of uh, bread mold uh, I find to be interesting and important for you to, little, to at least look at and, and know. So we could start anywhere in this life cycle. Let's start at, uh, at uh, meiosis. So during the process of meiosis we form spores. There is a stalk called a sporangium that produces the spores, and the spores go out, as you can see over here, and they form mating strains. Here we have a mating strain that we call the minus mating strain, and here we have a mating strain called the positive mating strain. So these are different, these are different organisms of the same species. Well, at some point in time, these mating strains, the hyphae, will come close together, and you can see there's a positive and negative mating strain that's come close together. And uh, these will be these little structures, these out uh, swellings will be called gametangia. And uh, they will eventually fuse and uh, they will form a zygote. The zygote will then uh, produce a little stalk and uh, it will produce the sporangium. 
which will undergo meiosis to produce the, uh, the new mating strains, or the spores which will lead to the new mating strains. Phylum uh, Ascomycota, uh, these are also known as sac fungi. These are really cool. When you go outside and you find these, they look like little sacs. Um, the reason they call them uh, sac fungi is because they have an ascus. Then these little, these little, these little asci or sacs uh, will uh, basically hold uh, haploid ascospores that are formed in the process of meiosis. Members of this group include the yeasts. Uh, I would assume that you have cooked food before. Maybe you've made fresh bread and you've used yeast before. Maybe you brew your own uh, your own wine and or ferment your own wine. Uh, but these are used in uh, baking, brewing, and wine for uh, formation. So these are very common, very economically important organisms called yeasts. Some members of this group are, are very serious plant uh, uh, pathogens. They cause plant diseases and food spoilage. And, uh, and some of them are delicacies. You can make a fortune if you are able to raise and or collect uh, morels and truffles. Um, these are delicacy uh, fungi. So here is a morel. These are common in Virginia. Uh, we can find those uh, in various places. They're found on uh, Patrick Henry Community College campus. And, uh, and these are truffles over here. I, I've never found a truffle before. I don't even know if they're in our local area. But they have trained uh, pigs and uh, various animals to be able to sniff these out and collect these so that they can sell them at the, at the store. So in this particular group, we have a, a, a pathogen of bats that I wanted to make you aware of. Um, it's a, a pathogen that causes white nose syndrome. And uh, this is the genus species name of the organism, Pseudogymnoascus uh, destructens. It's a very interesting name. And uh, you can see in the, in the species name destructens, it kind of indicates what it's going to do. This organism has infected bats in the United States. We think that this uh, pathogen came from Europe and was spread by cavers, uh, uh, spelunk by spelunking or caving. So cavers went to Europe and they got the spores on their body. They came back over and went into um, our native caves and then they spread the organism uh, throughout, uh, throughout Virginia. Uh, this is actually happening all over the East Coast, and it's even spread to the West Coast. Um, so this particular organism is responsible for killing millions and millions of our native bats. If you notice right here, it shows the white nose. So this is how it got its title, uh, White Nose Syndrome. And uh, if you take and stretch a wing out, you can see little patches on this wing where the fungus is growing. So this fungus grows, it kills cells. Uh, I think the most recent uh, information I've gathered on white nose syndrome is that the bat dies um, perhaps because of hyperkalemia. Uh, As these cells are killed, it releases, um, it releases potassium into the bloodstream, and that can cause irregular heartbeats. So sometimes it'll cause the animals to even come out of hibernation and then lose all their energy stores um, flying around and uh, coming out of uh, hibernation. So that causes their death, too. Uh, this is serious. You know, I know you probably don't want bats in your house or bats flying around you, but uh, bats are really important at, uh, at uh, eating uh, insects. They keep insect prey down. So we really are concerned about this because there are whole bat colonies that are being destroyed by this organism. Hopefully in the future we'll find some way to vaccinate bats or have some kind of antifungal cure. Or perhaps maybe we can create a vaccine and vaccinate enough, vaccinate enough bats, or maybe we will even, uh, or maybe natural selection will just create natural resistance in our native bats. But uh, when you lose all the bats, you're going to have lots of more, a lot more insects. So a few other important uh, ascomycetes would be the baker's yeast, so sarcomyces. Uh, Myces uh, cerviciae. Um, this is the yeast we use for making wine, making bread, very important organism commercially. Uh, penicillium uh, is going to be a bacteria, a fungi that we use to produce antibiotics. The first antibiotic that we discovered is penicillin and it came from, uh, from one of these uh, species. Aspergillus is, uh, is a mold and many of you probably have allergic reactions to um, 
to aspergillus uh, uh, spores or, or other parts of aspergillus. Uh, these can cause allergic reactions, nasal and respiratory infections, and uh, this particular group also can grow on food and release uh, aflatoxins. Aflatoxins are carcinogenic chemicals that um, that the uh, organism releases onto the food, and it has been linked to the to causing cancer. There are many people who actually take peanut butter. Peanut butter is a place where the, this aspergillus will grow. And uh, they'll take their peanut butter and actually put it in their refrigerator so to slow down the production of aflatoxins. But these aflatoxins can be found on bread. We probably eat them every day, not knowing it. But if you eat enough of them, that is a carcinogen and can possibly cause problems for you. Dermatophytes, uh, just as a, as a kind of a generic grouping, um, they can cause things. These are uh, ascomycetes that uh, cause ringworm, athlete's foot, and other skin, uh, skin uh, diseases. So I had a few pictures here I'll show you in just a second. Uh, Aspergillus is beautiful. Look at it uh, stained here under a microscopic, microscopic slide. You can see the little spores being released from it. This over here is penicillium, and uh, this is uh, sarcomyces. Uh, or baker's yeast. So kind of cool cool looking organisms. Uh, this is ringworm. A lot of people think that it's actually a worm under the skin because of this little raised area. It looks like a round worm, but it's actually a fungal infection. And then here is athlete's foot. Uh, I know it's kind of silly, but if you ever go to uh, water parks or if you go to take a shower in some public place, like uh, perhaps at the gym, you know, you might want to bring, bring some shower shoes so you can uh, not uh, pick up this particular organism. Basidiomycota is, uh, is uh, another group uh, or phylum of fungi. Uh, its reproductive structures form uh, the mushroom that you usually associate with fungi. So when you see a mushroom, that is a reproductive structure. The actual body of the fungus really is underground and, uh, and, and lots of strains of, uh, of hyphae. Or strands of hyphae. So Basidiomycota includes things like stinkhorns and puffballs, shelf fungi, and toadstools. I'll show you some pictures of those in a second. Smuts and rusts are also members of this group, and these are plant pathogens. So if we take a look at some of these, uh, these organisms, we see over here a stinkhorn. Okay, that looks like the dog stinkhorn. It actually looks like a dog penis, and that's why they call it a dog stinkhorn. So it's a, it's a neat fungi. I mean, I've seen them several times. They're really kind of cool looking. Maybe you'll see one uh, as you're walking around this uh, uh, during the year this year. So these are shelf fungi. They grow on the sides of trees and oftentimes on logs. These are just toadstools, and uh, you are probably familiar with these. And, uh, you know, if, if you ever see a red fungi, you want to be careful of that. That would be a warning color to you that they may be uh, somehow toxic. Um, but there are also white fungi that can kill you as well. So don't just use color. And I'm sure you've all kicked a puffball before and saw the little cloud of spores come out. So in that cloud of spores, there's billions and billions of, uh, um, of spores that can go out and form new puffballs. This is a smut. Okay, so you can see the outline. I'm just outlining it here for you. This is the fungal growth, and this happens to be an ear of corn that the smut is growing through. So you can see economically that would be an important uh, fungi because it uh, destroys our crops. And rust also destroys our crops as well. So you can see the little rust-colored uh, fungi growing all over the surface of this leaf. Um, there is a wheat rust that's really serious because, you know, we eat a lot of wheat products and uh, we don't want uh, the rust to destroy that. There are many fungicides that we have to use in order to, uh, to help crops survive so we can bring food to market. And unfortunately, there is this thing called natural selection. And when you use lots of chemicals against these fungi, they evolve resistance to it. So that's something to be uh, somewhat concerned about. This is uh, another basidiomycote, uh, and uh, this happens to be the magic mushroom. It forms a chemical called psilocybin, and this is a hallucinogenic uh, molecule. So there are people that take and harvest these and then take them and, and, uh, and have the hallucinogenic drugs um, uh, from psilocybin. So that chemical is made to deter... Um, predators of the fungi. So, and then some people just use it recreationally, I guess. This particular fungi has an interesting uh, kind of, uh, of uh, 
food, uh, not food, well, excuse me, an interesting kind of uh, mode of reproduction. So um, I wanted to show you the life cycle of it. So it has mating strains, positive and negative mating strains. These mating strains will come together when they get ready to go through reproduction. And uh, when they come together, this is called plasmogamy. And uh, so if you ever look at a fungi, the fungi is made of lots and lots of hyphae where these cells come together and they actually fuse together. Now the fungi, the, 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 excuse me, the nucleus doesn't fuse together yet, but in the mushroom you have lots of these cells here that are dikaryotic. So they have two nuclei inside of one cell. And uh, eventually these nuclei will undergo karyogamy where they'll fuse together. And uh, since each of, these, each of these nuclei were haploid, through karyogamy we now have diploid nuclei. So the nuclei have two sets of chromosomes. And uh, through the process of meiosis, uh, the spores are going to be produced. So we produce spores by meiosis, which will then create negative and positive mating strains which will then undergo plasogamy and continue the life cycle. So kind of a little bit of an interesting life cycle. I would assume you have seen a fairy ring before. A fairy ring is the structure that you're seeing here. So this is a fairy ring and it wasn't created by fairies. It actually was created by, uh, it's actually created by all the hyphae underground so if you were to take and do testing underground, you would see all kinds of fungal hyphae. And at the edge of the, where the hyphae um, extend to, this is where mushrooms are created. Now mushrooms are created on the edge so they can release spores so that they can spread the fungi and not compete with it. You know, if you drop spores in the center here, so if you drop spores in the center, you know, you, the spores would be competing with the, with, the, with the parent that created the spores. But if we drop the spores outside of the fairy ring, then we can expand, ever expand the growing fairy ring. Glomerulomycota is the, is the last phylum that we'll talk about here. Uh, all known species grow in relation with plant roots, so they grow inside of plant roots and on the surface of plant roots, and they actually help plants grow better. They're not parasites, but they actually live in mutualistic relationships. Uh, you know, generally speaking, about 80% of the known plants have these relationships with uh, fungi. Uh, glomeromycetes form what we call mycorrhizae, or fungus roots. So this occurs when the fungus grows inside the roots and it's a mutualistic relationship. Now um, what the, what the uh, fungus gets is nutrients from the plant. What the plant gets is the ability of the fungus to, to uh, absorb minerals and nutrients more effectively than even the plant roots can do. So, you know, ecologically fungi are really super important. I want you to realize that and appreciate that. Uh, they are decomposers, so anything that falls dead is susceptible to decomposition by fungi. Um, that includes plants and animals. They are recyclers, so as they decompose and, and uh, break things down, they recycle the nutrients that plants can use. And of course, you know we eat plants, so we have to have recycling of nutrients for the plants. They form the mutualistic relationships that you're familiar with called mycorrhizae, the fungus roots. They help plants to absorb minerals and nutrients more effectively. And uh, they form uh, fungal human uh, mutualistic relationships. The leafcutter ants uh, form fungal gardens where they actually grow the fungus and they feed the fungus. The fungus they eat off of, but uh, they actually can grow the fungus and the fungus survives better with the ants. Uh, I did put a uh, video online for you to look at about fungal, um, the fungal gardens and how fungi and uh, fungi and ants uh, relate to each other in regards to leafcutter ants. The last thing I want to talk about is uh, our lichens. Lichens are fungal and um, algae uh, organisms that are mutualistically living together. And uh, alone, they don't do so well, but together they do very well. This happens to be a picture of British uh, soldiers. It's one of my favorite lichens because of the color of it. It's around, uh, you know, Virginia. So take a look outside. Maybe you can see some of these fungi that we've talked about. 
Lichens are really kind of complex organisms. They are mutualistic organisms. You can see that the algae is uh, surrounded by and protected by the fungal uh, portion. So the fungi makes up the body. You can see the hyphae of the, of the fungi grows all around the, uh, the algae. It creates an outer crust and an inner crust or cortex and uh, shields the algae. Algae produce food from photosynthesis that feeds the fungi. The fungi absorb minerals and water and shield the, uh, the, the algae from extreme ultraviolet light and from being destroyed by ultraviolet light. You can see the uh, symbiont layer right here, the algae layer right here, and this would be the fungal portion here and here. And this is just an electron microscope picture I thought was, that was beautiful. It shows you the hyphae. It also shows you the, uh, the, symbiotic, uh, the symbiotic algae living inside of the fungi. You can see the outer crust and then the, the outer crust on either side of the fungi. Really cool organism. So the fungi actually grows into, this is just, just trying to show you, this is a picture trying to show you that it literally grows into the algae to absorb nutrients from it. And uh, the way that a lichen reproduces is it uh, some fungi hyphae and, uh, and an algae cell will form a ceridia. The ceridia will uh, blow away or, or move away as an animal touches the lichen. And uh, when this thing lands, it has an algae ready to go. It has the fungal hyphae and it grows into a new lichen. Now, lichens are really important because they show air quality. If you go to a city that doesn't have lichens, um, that usually indicates air pollution. So these things will absorb air pollution. Many of the toxins in air pollution include mercury, and that kills lichens. So if you go outside and you see lichens all over your trees, eh, it might be a good indication that you live in an area with uh, good air quality. Now there's uh, three flavors, I mean, not flavors, you don't want to taste them, but there's three kinds of lichens. There's crustose lichens, foliose lichens, and fruticose lichens. Crustose lichens are crusty. They usually are found on um, rocks or stones or stove pavement, stone pavements or bricks outside in your, uh, of your house. Foliose are more leaf-like and fruticose are more kind of shrubby-like uh, lichens. So these are just a few crustose lichens for you to look at. Uh, you can see they are encrusted on rocks and they grow. You know, they start right here and they grow out in periphery. Some of these things can be really old and, uh, and uh, go out and look for some of them. These are foliose lichens. These are ones like you would find on the surface of your tree, on the bark of your tree. And uh, these are more leaf-like. And uh, you can even see a little sack right there, which is kind of cool. And uh, these are foliose lichens. Excuse me, fruticose lichens. Fruticose lichens uh, are in this area. This is one that's attached to a tree, and this is one that you can oftentimes find on the ground. And uh, these fruticose lichens are really, really important when you go up into habitats like the tundra. The tundra has lots and lots and lots of these lichens, and it forms the base of, of, of the food chain. So caribou will eat those things, and of course other creatures eat caribou like uh, wolves. So they are important in that regard for forming food chains. Uh, go outside, look for these things, they're everywhere. What's interesting about lichens is oftentimes they'll have little communities that live inside of them. So if you took a lichen and, and soaked it in water and squeezed it out, you might find paramecium. You might find little nematode worms. You might find these little creatures called gastrotri gastrix, um, gastrotrix. And you might even found uh, tardigrades or water bears. Probably the water bear is one of my favorite creatures of all time that live inside of uh, lichens. So these are really, really extreme animals that can survive many extreme environments. So I encourage you to go out and take a look at fungi. Uh, I think they're incredible organisms. I hope that you'll grow some. If you follow your lab, you'll be growing some. And uh, hopefully I wish that you never get any of them as diseases. These are medically important, they're economically important, they run the world, you can't live with them, you can't live without them. So amazing creatures, these things we call fungi. As usual, make sure you do your study guides, make sure you follow all your activities, you keep up with your due dates, and that uh, you don't feel alone, but you feel like uh, you, know, you can talk to other people in the class and that you can talk to me through email. So um, I wish you a good day.